first talk in this session is from Fungible. Um, our speaker today from Fungible is Rajan Goyal, who is CTO and uh, is responsible for overall strategy and execution of hardware acceleration technologies that are integrated into Fungible's portfolio. Um, Rajan brings a wealth of experience in silicon and systems as well as software. And prior to Fungible, he led the architecture team in Cavium's CTO department. So Rajan, you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rajan Goel. I'm Chief Technology Officer of Fungible. Today, I'm really excited to share details of the Fungible technology. My presentation will have two parts. During first part, I'm going to talk about a key innovation, the Fungible DPU, which sits at the intersection of compute, networking, and storage. During second part of my presentation, I will share details about a scale-out storage product, which is powered by the Fungible DPU. So behind all this, Fun Fungible's mission is to revolutionize the next generation data centers. So before I begin my presentation, I also wanted to share Fungible's vision for next generation data centers. So if you look at today's data centers, they are facing multiple headwinds which threaten to destroy the agility and volume economics of scale out architecture. So at Fungible, we spend quite a bit of time looking at the root causes of the problems that data centers are facing. So first is if you profile any application which is running scale out in data center, you will notice that more and more CPU cycles are spent on data centric computations and general purpose CPU is inefficient <coughs> data computations. Second is that most of the applications which are scale out are built on microservices. So there's a lot more east-west traffic, but the data interchange between server nodes is inefficient. If you look at the links at, in the data center, they are 20 to 30% utilized to cap the tail latency. This all results in inefficiencies in the data center. Now fungible DPU addresses these root causes. In addition, it also fundamentally provides improves the reliability, security, and agility of the data center. Now at Fungible, we believe that data centers are transitioning from compute-centric era to data-centric era. And in this new era, we need a new architecture for the data centers. And we call it hyper-desegregated architecture. So in this architecture, first of all, there are going to be very small number of server types, which are built with the best of the breed components. For example, compute will have x86 plus DRAM. Storage will be with SSDs or hard drives and AI servers with GPU plus DRAM. All these four server types are powered by fungible DPU. In this case, G DPU serves two purpose. One is it executes the data centric computations and order of magnitude more efficient compared to general purpose CPU. In addition, it also frees up the CPU cycles for application processing. Second, it acts as an endpoint of fungible true fabric technology which lets us connect these servers using standard IP over ethernet network. Now, as a result, the expensive resources like SSDs or GPUs, which were stranded behind general purpose CPU are now desegregated and pooled over network, which results in the efficiency of the, net, of the data center because all the resources are now fully utilized. Now, if, if in, instead of having a separate islands of different resources for different workloads, now you can build a common infrastructure, which is hyper desegregated and use the help of a software composer. You can now compose dynamically compose an elastic data center specific to a different workload. So there is no need to have separate islands of resources dedicated for different resources in this newer generation of the data centers. So with that background, let me now start my presentation with details of fungible DPU. So fungible DPU is a family of processors. We have two silicons which are already in production, F1 and S1. They share same common hardware architecture as well as exactly same programming model. Only difference is their performance points. So F1 is a 400 gig full duplex and S1 is 200 gig full duplex part. Now, just because of their performance and power footprint, they are packaged differently and they are targeted for different applications. For example, with F1, we can build appliances for storage target or layer four to layer seven appliances in the networking or even AI servers or analytic servers. On the other side, S1 fits into a PCI form factor. As a result, it will go into any standard x86 based server and it will offload networking, storage, 
security and virtualization data path from the CPU, which will result in higher utilization and also free up the expensive cores for application processing. Now, most of bulk of my presentation is now going to use F1 as a reference for all the specification as well as the performance that I will share. I'll be happy to give details of S1 offline or don't hesitate to contact Fungible team after the presentation. So let's look at the F1's high level block diagram. So I will start cover the IOs. F1 has two kinds of memories. One for high capacity memory, we use DDR4. For high bandwidth memory, we use HBM. We also have network unit, which supports eight by 100 gig gigabit ethernet ports. And it also implements the end point of true fabric technology. Third, there's a host unit which supports 64 PCI Gen 3, Gen 4 lanes. And at the granularity of four lanes, you can configure it as root complex or endpoint. Now let's look, look inside the chip. Inside the chip, we have two types of compute. One is a programmable compute. And second is very carefully chosen and tightly integrated hardware accelerators. And both this compute programmable as well as hardware accelerators are organized into clusters. We have two types of clusters. One is data cluster. As the name suggests, data cluster is used to implement data path. And the control cluster, second is control cluster, which is used to implement control plane, execute control plane on top of standard unmodified Linux. Now these clusters are connected with a low latency, high bandwidth network, which also connects the clusters to the IO blocks. So the chip on chip network provides a uniform access to memory as well as IOs. That makes the software programming model much, much simpler and efficient. Now let's look into a lot more details into the data cluster. So data cluster, as I said, has both cores as well as hardware accelerators. So in a single cluster, we have six cores and each core is four-way SMT. As a result, you can see there are 24 threads per cluster and in F1, we have 192 data threads. So besides that, we also have rich set of accelerators for six different domains. So first is for data movement. We have a very flexible DM engine, which can move data from any memory to any memory. Secondly, most of the applications running on F1 or the DPUs are stateful. That means that before you process a packet, you need to find the associated state along with that, associated with that packet. So in order to do that, you need to do a lookup. So we support a very flexible lookup engine, which provides flexibility in the key size, the number of keys, number of tuples, the number of table entries and the number of tables. This is only limited by the attached memory. The third domain is for data security. We have a tremendous support for line rate or wire speed data security, bulk encryption and decryption for both data in motion as well as at rest. Besides that, we also support hashing for authentication. We support all modes of SHA-1, SHA-2 and SHA-3. And the next one is the data reduction domain. This is a very important feature for us because we are also targeting for the storage market where the effective capacity is important. Now we have a very rich set of data reduction techniques. One is for lossless compression for not only text binary, which is supported by many uh, silicons in the, in the industry, but we also do lossless compression on JPEG images. Besides, we also have sophisticated data deduplication techniques implemented in the data reduction module. And I will share some performance characteristics of our data reduction block. The next is for data protection. Again, almost most of the data in the data centers or enterprises need to be durable so that you are protecting against failures. Now, general technique used for failure prevention is replication of data, which is easier on compute, but it is costly from storage point of view. The other techniques like RAID or erasure coding are well documented but they are used only for lazily or for cold data because it, you cannot put it in the inline in the data path because of the computation um, uh, that you have to spend. In case of F1 and S1, both our fungible DPU, we have sophisticated data protection engine, which can provide inline erasure coding, all the sophisticated erasure coding schemes deployed in the data center without any impact on the latency or application performance at the user. And finally, last but not the least, we have data analytics engine. And by the way, all of these engines are multi-threaded accelerators, not just one accelerator. So data analytics serves two purpose. One in the networking world for layer four to layer seven services environment, it can be used for pattern matching, for firewalling, intrusion detection system, data leakage prevention, URL filtering, and so on. And in the storage world, it can be used for filtering of the data for data analytics. 
Now, as you can see that each data cluster has a rich set of programmable as well as hardware accelerators. Now let's look at the control cluster. So control cluster has four cores. Each code is two-way multi-threaded. So there are eight threads for control code, control cluster. And as I said, it runs unmodified Linux for control pen applications. It has its own class of accelerators. First is it provides secure enclave, which is used for secure boot. And also we provide secure key vault, which is used for storing all the private keys securely. Even the fungible software cannot access those keys. Second, we have a very rich set of key engines for public key crypto. This is used for SSL, TLS, or HTTPS. And we support both RSA up to 4K, as well as all the TLS 1.3 curves or elliptic curve. And these are all hardware accelerated. Next, it supports true random number generator. And finally, it supports physical unclonable function, which provides a unique cryptographic identity to every silicon. With that, even though there are multiple blocks in F1 or fungible DP worth talking or sharing, but with the interest of time, I'm gonna show performance characteristics of two key blocks in the F1. First, let's look at the data reduction. So let I will call it zip block. So in the zip block, we support two modes. One is a low latency and high throughput mode, and second is a high compression mode. So let me first share the performance characteristics of our low latency and high throughput mode. Here I'm comparing it with the standard GZIP implemented on state-of-the-art high-end x86 Xeon server. And also I'm comparing with F1 implementation of that. Now, as you we are comparing with five different standard corpus, which are used to compare these compression algorithms. And it's a trade-off, if you know, real, know the problem, it's a generally it's a trade-off between compression ratio and the throughput that you get. Now, if you notice in case of F1, we are 97% of the compression ratio given by GZIP, the highest level dash nine, but we are 200 X faster compared to X86 server. So that's the kind of performance that F fungible DP delivers. Now, if you look at the compre compression optimized or the compression ratio optimized more, here, there are a lot more other algorithms emerging in the data center. Leading one is Google's Brotly. So I'm comparing our solution, which is a standard LZMA mode with both GZIP standard gzip running on x86 and a broadly level 9 running on x86 as you can see that from gzip we are 15 to 20 percent higher compression ratio and still giving 30x faster when we are in compression optimized mode but as compared to broadly we are 95 percent of the broadly's compression ratio but at least two orders of magnitude faster what it means is that the fungible dpu will enable the new next generation products where user will not have to think about or do a trade-off between performance as well as the quality or the effective capacity. You can always enable inline compression without worrying about any impact on the application performance. Now let me focus on another key block inside fungible DPU. It's the end point of true fabric. As I said in the beginning of my presentation, today's data centers run links at 20 to 30% utilization in order to cap the tail latency. Here we are showing results from a cluster reasonably size of 1K nodes. Each node is 200 gigabit connected. Now there are three modes in which we tested it. One is node to node, second is any to any, and third is all to one mode. Obviously all to one mode is the most complicated mode. Now, as you can see, first thing to highlight is that all the links are running more than 90% utilization. And while running at that high utilization, our tail latency is very, very close to the mean latency. And not only the latency, mean latency is lower, but even our tail latency is, is very close to the mean latency. What it means is that, first of all, now the data centers, even networking will be fully utilized, network links. Secondly, this is the key technology which lets us disaggregate all the expensive resources at a scale of data center, and then without impacting the application performance. Now, at Fungible, we not only innovated at the architecture of the Fungible DPU, we also invented a new asynchronous data path programming model, and we call it any to any call continue. It's a hybrid solution, both hardware and software, but at the end of the day, it's a generalization of call return, where callee, instead of returning back to the caller, continues the call to the next stage. Now, you can imagine that you can implement an asynchronous data path using this model, which is gives you high performance as well as very, very efficiently and utilizes all the resources inside the silicon. The, in contrast, people write 
it's easier programming model which is synchronous but then you are wasting the cpu cycles for while waiting for the resources and as a result of that most of the performance i will show is built using this call continue model now fungible it's obvious also based on the our uh, uh, all the disclaimer that we have done already but fungible is not just a silicon company besides silicon and stk we have a fully production quality software for few verticals for example i'm listing here for networking storage virtualization security and analytics in fact the scale out storage product that i'm going to share at the end of the presentation is built using our production quality network and storage stack now because of the versatility of fungible dpu and because it is fully programmable it can be applied to many infrastructure services so here in order to in the limitation of time i am sharing for three different domains first is for transport which could be standard tcp or even secure like tls termination or ipsec second is for layer 4 to layer 7 services like stateful firewall ovs data path or load balancer and third domain is for storage which could be vending storage at block or by video streaming now for all these three domains i am listing the performance number which is a full duplex measured using production quality software in our lab only caveat is that the whole dpu in this case f1 is dedicated for that service obviously if you mix and match the performance will not be uh, addition of all this now even with that caveat you will notice that our performance is 5 to 10x better than is equivalent functionality implemented on x86 based servers so that speaks highly about the capability of fungible dpu not only in performance not only in the quality but also in the versatility for different infrastructure services now let me switch to my second part of my presentation which is a details about scale out storage and this is also powered by fungible dpu if we call it fungible storage cluster so the building block for fungible storage cluster is fungible storage node we call fs1600 it's a 2u box with 24 front loadable standard of the shelf ssds now let me highlight three different aspects of the solution which are enabled by fungible dpu first of all let's look at the raw performance so before i share the raw numbers on the right side let's focus on the left side so there are two important aspects of the solution which are enabled by directly by fungible dpu first is that typically ssds and the network they have been improving faster than compute if you look at the last decade and as a result of that even though ssds could deliver 20 to 25 gig each ssd but the same performance is not exposed to the application on the other side of the network because the cpus in the middle are bottleneck but in case of fungible dpu we are able to deliver raw read performance which is limited by ssd not by the dpu the second point to highlight is that even when you enable compute intensive services like compression or encryption the performance remains unchanged so that's directly translates the values or the capabilities of fungible dpu at the product level now let's look at the raw numbers so first focus on the top right so just like any storage product we also provide two kinds of storage for ephemeral storage which is raw we can do uh, this fungible storage cluster single node can do 15 million iops and for durable it can do close to 9 million iops now as a relative comparison i'm comparing it with not only the ceph you can see is lot more different lot more uh, multiplying factor but if i compare with the nearest competitor for the same apple to apple comparison we are at least 3x better for read iops and 2 to 3x better for write iops and not only on the throughput but also our latency is for read very close to the competition but for write latency 2 to 3x better and this is all because of the capabilities of fungible dpu now let me look at the show you the second aspect of the solution which is the cost efficiency so cost efficiency is delivered because of four aspects of the fungible dpu's capability one is as i mentioned we have a superior compression which can be done in line as a result of that you can always keep it on and have a higher effective storage capacity which translates to lower cost second is that generally as i said data is durable and technique used is replication which is easier for compute but costly from storage point of view the other techniques are erasure coding now with the help of fungible dpu we can have low overhead durability techniques like erasure coding but still providing durability equal to or higher than replication 
Third is that data is always secure in fungible storage cluster, whether in motion or at rest. As a result, there is no need for adding self-encrypting drives, which are costly. And the last is that because of the high performance, it can support large number of customers in a small footprint. Now, let me focus on the third aspect of the uh, solution, which is security. And I put security into two components, where first of all, data has to be secure, but also your infrastructure need to be secure. So uh, it's now obvious that fungible DPU supports encryption, decryption at line rate, but not only that, it is built for cloud native applications. We have fun fundamentally support for multi-tenancy. And one of the facet asset for that is that we provide every customer, every tenant a unique key so that the data, there is no data leakage between multiple tenants residing on the same fungible storage cluster. But those keys are stored in the secure enclave that I was sharing earlier. And they're all encrypted and not even fungible software can access it. And second part is that, in order, another aspect of security is the security of the infrastructure. Because of the secure boot and sec root of trust inside fungible DPU, it will enforce that only signed binaries execute, which makes the solution less vulnerable to any malware or other attacks in the data center. So this, with the help of fungible DPU, we can provide a holistic secure, secure solution for the data center. Now that's not all. If you recall, I mentioned that we have two uh, DPUs, S1 and F1. This is my last slide. Now S1 goes into the uh, servers in a PCI form factor where it offloads the CPU for all for the application processing. Other than that, there's an end-to-end -end advantage because now we can do compression on the host side. That means we can use inline without any impact on the latency and that saves the network bandwidth. Second is that we can do end-to-end -end compression. End-to-end uh, uh, -end compression. Second is it we can do end-to-end -end encryption, which help, gives them end-to-end security from application to that. Now, this is the last slide, which is that not only it's high performance, low cost, and always secure, it's also scales linearly with performance. With that, I would like to involve all, invite all of you to join us at the breakout session, where we will give more details of the products, as well as my colleagues will join me for it, answering your any other question. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Rajan. I want to make sure we have time for audience questions. I see we do have some in the queue here. I have a couple of quick questions uh, before we get to audience questions. So on the FS uh, 1600 performance numbers you showed, um, are those for NVMe over TCP? That's correct. Those are NV measured with NVMe over TCP. In fact, when we use NVMe over True Fabric as a list on the bottom left, the performance will be better. But at right now, these are measured NVMe over TCP, standard TCP. Right, which is what a customer would get if they're using the, the appliance with their existing servers. That's exactly right, yes. Right. Okay, and then second question, I, I'm not a, an expert on storage compression, so I think you kind of lost me on the zip block. Um, I was confused as to whether it implements LZMA or a proprietary compression algorithm. Well, thank you for follow-up, Bob. So we support two algorithms. One is deflate, which is standard, and LZMA, which is standard. There is no proprietary algorithm. All I was highlighting is that even with the standard algorithms, we are comparing with the standard deflate on the GZIP when it's a high compression um, on the low latency and high throughput mode. And in, 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 a, in a high compression mode, again, it's a standard LZMA. I'm comparing with GZIP as well as Google's property algorithm. But these are okay, standard thanks. algorithms. There is okay. no proprietary algorithm from Fungible. Great, thanks for the clarification. Okay, let me uh, jump to some audience questions here. We've got a few, and if we don't get to, to them all, uh, Rajan will be available in the breakout, so please join him there and uh, get your remaining um, questions answered. Um, so uh, on the F1 DPU is the aggregate networking throughput 800 gig, I think it's um, 400 gig full duplex, is that correct? That's correct, it's 400 gig full duplex. Okay, great. Um, the next one went over my head. Um, I'm not familiar with SDXI. So the question is whether the DME accelerator uh, is compatible with SDXI. Even I'm not actually uh, so, uh, uh, familiar with this term SDXI, but okay. I'll be happy to answer offline. I'll find the answer before that. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and then on the um, True Fabric performance, I think, um, there's questions here regarding kind of what the uh, all nodes to one um, test case was and how um, how that corresponds to the utilization link utilization. 
Yes. So what it means is that, as I was telling that, in-cast is the hardest problem from networking point of view. So in that case, all 1K nodes were sending traffic to one node, uh, uh, out of the 1K sending to one, one node on the destination. And even besides that, we were able to have the, uh, the uh, uh, tail latency very, very close to the mean latency. That's the point of that. Okay, yep, that's the in-cast scenario. Um, and I think uh, let me jump to a different uh, attendee here. So um, I think this is an important question because there's some, uh, there's a lot of talk about smart NICs and I think um, maybe it'd be helpful if you can explain sort of the, your view on the difference between the fungible DPU and the smart NICs that are in the market. Well, um, there are a lot of differences. First of all, fungible DPU, for us, smart NIC is just one of the functionality. Uh, it's not the only thing that fungible DPU does, specifically the S1 uh, uh, silicon. So it is used, it can do virtualization data path, it can execute storage data path, it can do security, it can do networking data path, it can do analytics and so on. So it's, it's a much richer set of applications which can be integrated and offloaded into a fungible DPU. So, and, but if you go by the standard definition of smart NIC that anything but networking is offloaded in that case, um, um, uh, that is the definition of smart NIC. But what we think is the fungible DPU is more holistic, not just looking at the networking part. Traditionally, you need a separate network for storage, separate network for networking. And in the, with the help of fungible DPU you, can, DPU, you can integrate both the storage as well as the network data side of the network into single, and it will provide the um, uh, quality of service and all this uh, performance benefits that we have for both storage as well as networking. While you can offload virtualization, you can offload security. So we believe that fungible DPU is more holistic and it's solving the host side of the problem much, much complete com in a complete sense rather than just a smart NIC uh, solution out there. Okay, thanks. A um, couple of device specific questions on the F1 um, process technology and also how much SRAM you have on chip? So process is we were very, very conservative in our process. All the advances are in the architecture and software. So we are 60 nanometer. Now, in terms of SRAM, we have lots of SRAM, including caches and on-chip memory. So I don't have the exact number, but it will be north of 100 megabyte plus. But this is not like a um, just a uh, blind data, uh, memory allocated for caches, assuming it will work. These are very carefully chosen design for memory hierarchy, for data movement, for the, uh, for the control structure and so on. But if I were to add all of that, it may be north of 128 or uh, megabyte or so. I don't know the exact number right now. Uh, okay, a large amount. <laughs> it's a large amount, yes. but it is scattered and it is for a custom provisioned, uh, uh, designed custom designed for the use cases. Because the uh, I think the root cause of root prop question is that the in, in, in this kind of application the caches don't work because there is not much tempor uh, spatial uh, temporal locality it's mostly spatial locality for the cache line that you're fetching so you have to be very very careful when you design the caches so that you are not polluting the your control structures and so on and then and that's our key innovation in the fungible DPU as a result of that even with the small DRAM a small SRAM, we can have high, high throughput. And our performance does not degrade when we enable these heavy duty functions. Even if in a data path, you enable compression, security, or erasure coding, our performance still remains a line rate. So we are not saying that 400 gig with only no, no services on. We are saying 400 gig with most of these services on. And which one of the reasons which is possible is because of our carefully chosen memory hierarchy design. And caches are part of that. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to close with one higher level question here because I think this is probably important um, for people to understand who are your target customers? Are you targeting cloud providers or are you targeting enterprise data centers? Well, that's a great question, Bob. So as a company, we are actually targeted for both hyperscalers as well as the next level of like enterprise, large enterprises and uh, which have their own private data centers as well. For the large and uh, for the hyperscalers, we have our cards or silicons as a business. But for the general market, we also have a products. And one of the product is FSC that we announced yesterday will be fully, we have both data plane, uh, control plane, orchestration management. It's a complete solution that we are selling for those customers. Okay, thanks. We are um, out of time. So if uh, we didn't get to your question, um, please join Rajan in the breakout session at um, uh, the end of this session, which will be at uh, 11.40. Um, so thank you, Rajan. <laughs>